Uh, now, without losing time, I would uh, like to invite uh, Mr. Rob uh, from Ampa International to take the event further. Thank you. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping right now and um, unplug my computer to plug in something else. But that's a good thing because that means that we'll only be talking for a couple, uh, maybe an hour and a half before the computer dies. So it's good timing. <laughs> There we go. Um, again, my name is Rob Clausen. I come from the AMP International Headquarters in Chicago in, in the United States. Um, I am the Associate Director of Marketing and Communications. I am responsible for our brand, for our messaging, and for facilitating events such as this. Um, after, I'm going to give a brief introduction to AMCA for those of you who do not know who AMCA is and what we do as well as talk a little bit about our certified ratings program. Um, <clears throat> then I'm going to hand it over to the technical experts. We'll talk with um, Nomar from Aldis. We'll talk about sand luber sizing and specification. Then uh, Dipin Patel will talk about FEI, which is a new fan efficiency uh, uh, matrix or metric that uh, we have just introduced. Um, the fan system effect case studies from Temoj Chaudhry from uh, Mako Golf, and then we'll just do some uh, closing questions and answers in uh, recognition of our sponsors. Okay, now it works. So an introduction to AMCA International. AMCA stands for the Air Movement and Control Association. We are truly an international corporate um, company or association. We've been in existence for, uh, we celebrated our 100th anniversary last year. We've been in, in, around since 1917. Um, we have currently more than 380 members, uh, and we are growing. We're primarily known for our uh, certified ratings program and the uh, specifications and standards that were, are set for a number of products in the air movement uh, and control industry. Um, we do correspond with the ISO standards as well. We work very closely with them to make sure that we are representing our members and representing the industry the best as we possibly can. We are very big into instruction and education. We have a number of materials on our website, white papers, uh, and we, as I said, we give presentations such as this um, around the world. Um, also big into advocacy. We work very closely with governmental agencies around the world to ensure that the industry is best represented and we are helping um, for things like uh, air quality and and the like to make sure that everyone is in the governmental side is understanding what we're doing through the EU, through GCC, through uh, the United States, and, and elsewhere. Like I said this new emphasis is uh, we're really pushing heavily into the industry training. And we have a number of uh, seminars and conferences that we've been holding around the world in the last, uh, last six months or so, and we're going to continue to do so, which are very specific. We bring in global experts to speak in, in regions and topics that are very uh, helpful to the industry, to engineers, to architects, and, and the like. As I said, we are global. Um, we have, of those 380 members plus, um, about 170 in the, 175 in the North America region in Mexico, a few in, in South America, 151 in Asia, 28 in Europe, 27 in the Middle East, um, we have the director of, of AMCA Europe here and the director of AMCA Middle East. They're uh, kind of arm wrestling to see who's going to uh, have the most members next time I give this presentation. In the Middle East, as I said, we have 27 member companies. Um, they represent eight different countries. We have a regional steering committee that meets to make sure that the uh, region is well represented internationally and with the board of directors so that we um, bring the issues that are affecting the region to bear internationally. Um, we have a regional marketing committee, so again, so that the, the voice of our members is heard amongst the industry and the, the government. Um, San Luber Committee, which is a very particular product, um, an important product here in this region. We have a committee that makes sure that we are staying up to date on the standards and influencing what is going to happen in, in the industry. And there's also one independent accredited lab, which is based locally. There's the breakdown of the 27 members. Um, Egypt, Kuwait, Lebanon, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and then 
lion's share, which are here in the UAE. The certified ratings program that I mentioned earlier, what, that, what the purpose of that is, we want to make sure that the products that the, bot, that the uh, end users are having have been tested to meet and exceed industry standards. We set these standards and standards of excellence. We want to ensure the honesty and accuracy in the ratings so that you as a designer, as an architect, are confident in what is being provided, that it is going to do what it says it does. It's not just going to be marketing speak, it is going to be actually tested and backed by laboratory results and testing. So if you see one of these seals, you know that it has been through rigorous testing and it has met the standards of the industry. So there are certain requirements. They can't just send it in and hope that it's going to depend. They have to meet rigorous uh, viewpoints and standards. They're verified by our staff. Um, we have the, pub the published catalog is available to everyone to make sure that they are uh, indeed meeting the standards and they're, we will then verify the test after they have met. So it's not just they can do it once and forget about it. We will come back and test them to make sure that they are maintaining the standards that they have agreed upon and they have met. So the process is basically five steps. Um, they apply, they ask for us to, to certify, a, a member will ask us to certify one of the products. We do the test, we'll then review the results, um, we'll certify it, and then we'll verify it. Said, down the line, we'll come back and do check, check tests to ensure that the product is maintaining the integrity and the standards that we have assessed. Where do we do this? We do this in labs throughout the world. Um, the AMCA headquarters lab in Chicago does all the tests except for some of the acoustic du uh, duct uh, silencer, which is uh, done at a, a sister lab in North America. Sepiat in, in France does a number of our fan tests and um, the acoustic duct silencer. Locally, Thomas Bell Wright tests the louvers for the pressure drop in the wind driven sand, which we'll discuss in more detail later. And then we have a couple in uh, Asia as well. There's one in Korea that tests fans, and then one in Malaysia that also tests fans and dampers. We will also accredit a number of our members' labs. We will check their labs to make sure that they are meeting the, the uh, standards of what we do in our labs. Just, it basically reduces the burden to our members, that we will check their labs to ensure that they are running uh, excellent um, technical facilities and then allow them to do some of the tests but, so we will check and, and verify these uh, quite rigorously and quite extensively. Um, again, there's 35 in North America, 10 in Europe, 2 locally in the Middle East, and then 6 in Europe. Total number of certified products we have out there right now. Um, several thousand. And, and growing. Every day I'm getting reports of, of more that are coming on board. But at last check we have about uh, almost 3,000 in North America and, and Mexico, 37 in Europe, 123 in the Middle East, and 877 in Asia. So there are a number of these products that have been certified and growing. What we like to think is that we have a local uh, perspective local representation, but we have the global recognition and the global support. Mandar Ashikar is our new director here in the Middle East. He's based locally in, in Dubai. Um, he's here to help you and support you, and we will support him. We will bring in the, uh, the resources that are necessary to help our members and the members market. We're very uh, committed to this, and the commit commitment is growing. So at that point, I'm going to turn it over to somebody a little bit more technical than me. Actually, a lot more technical than me. Um, the one from from out this Middle East is going to speak to you about sand louver sizing and specification. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Noman. And I will be speaking about the uh, uh, sand trap lower MCA certification and the process about uh, how to correctly specify sand trap lures and to how to select properly the sand trap lures. 
So for today's uh, workshop, these are the three learning objectives. So to understand about MCA certification of the Sandtrap Prover, plus how to correctly specify and how to correctly select the Sandtrap Provers. So just to introduce myself, my name is Noman. I am a project and technical manager in Aldes Middle East. And uh, I am a mechanical engineer by qualification. And uh, I have some cert professional certifications like for PQP for buildings, PQP for uh, Villa rating systems, and I sit and uh, I am sharing the uh, MCA Middle East Marketing Committee since last year, and I am part of the MCA Middle East Steering Committee, which is just recently formed. So this will raise the voice of this region to the International Board of Directors in MCA, which is in USA. I am also part of some uh, MCA Engineering Committees, like uh, the committee who developed this certification program for the Sandtrap Louvre testing and certification. So I was part of that committee. And I also sit in committees of uh, Louvre and Dampers for MCA. I'm also a member of uh, UL 555S and 555 for UL Underwriters Laboratory. So I'm a standard technical pan panel member for this. And of course, I'm a member of Azure, uh, Fallon and Chapter. So the first uh, learning objective about the MCA certification of sand Louvers. So it all started uh, in 2012, November 2012, when some of the members in this region, we approached MCA and we emphasized the need of this uh, certified program for sand trap louver, sand removal efficiency. Because we were having uh, different manufacturers presenting different types of efficiencies on their catalog and they were presenting some uh, standards which are not even relevant for the Sandtrap Lower. Like they were using 52, Azure 52, which is not for Sandtrap Lower, it is for filters. So they were presenting data on their catalogs and they were achieving 97%, 96% efficiencies on the one meter phase velocity, which is, you will see the reality when we will show you the certified data. So this, uh, standard was uh, finalized we had to write the standard then it went through a lot of approvals and c approvals it went through the engineering committee reviews we had to answer a lot of uh, queries raised by these people and finally we had to uh, accredit one lab here in the middle east region we they developed the chamber mca tested their chamber and finally it was launched in 2016 so it took four years to establish this program in this region and since it has been launched already, seven manufacturers have certified their products and they have MCA certified sand, uh, sand lure with wind driven sand MCA certified. So like uh, Rob has explained, so the process of certification is that you have to first test your product as per the applicable standard and then you have to uh, apply for the certification so the standard is MCA 511. So in this process, what, what is ensured by MCA is that uh, when this do the testing, they submit the test data to the manufacturers and they have a format. And the format is like for every manufacturer, they have to follow the same format. So when they're presenting their data, you when you have like multiple MCA certified manufacturers uh, catalog pages, it is very easy for you to compare those products because the data is presented in the same format. And once they uh, create the catalog page, they are not allowed to announce that they have the certification. It goes to MCA, they verify the data, whether whatever is mentioned on the catalog page is, it is actually correct or there has been some manipulation. So once this process is completed, MCA has, uh, announces that now you can announce that you have the certification and they publish this catalog page on their website as well. So it is the transparency and this is what uh, Rob was explaining that this is the peace of mind for the people who are specifying this product, MCA certified products, that the data which is presented in the catalog is not like fake, it is actually tested and verified data. So I will show you some uh, video just as a brief uh, There is some technic <laughs> technical fault. I will, I will make sure that you see the video at the end. So it's a very nice video. It's compiling like the whole concept about the certification, how, 
so uh, in short, like uh, MCA certification of Santa Blue World is the new benchmark. Like this is the way forward because you, when you see the reality, you see what you have been specifying is actually you know like uh, a bit far from the reality. And you can always uh, log into MCA uh, www.mca.org oblique send to work. So in this uh, website, you have a lot of documents which are relevant to this uh, MCA certification. There are white papers. There are all the manufacturers who have certified products. You can access their catalog pages on the same website. So how to correctly specify the send doers? Uh, we, we, because we meet a lot of consultants, we see a lot of specifications. So if you want to specify the anchor certified products, so you have to add this statement on your specification that sand lure shall be tested in accordance with MCA standard 500L and license to bear MCA certified rating program C for air performance and wind driven sand in accordance with MCA publication 511. So if you put this specification, if you put this statement in your specification, you will get a certified product and you will be having the peace of mind that the data which is presented on the catalog, it has been tested and reviewed by MCA and uh, this same catalog is also available on the website. So please note this uh, statement, I will leave it for a little while if anyone wants to take photos. This is the statement which you have to add in your uh, specification. So I will show you the reality, like uh, we have already seven manufacturers who has the MCA certified sand lure. And uh, this is the performance graph without showing the names of course of the manufacturers. So this is the trend. So you see here it is like uh, free area velocity versus the sand removal efficiency. So at the moment the test is conducted at five different velocities which is one meter per second. So you can see that all the manufacturers, they are having, like they are colored between 80 to 90 degree, or 80 to 90 percent at one meter per second free area velocity. But is it practical? It is not practical because one, a, one meter per second free area velocity means maybe almost no air velocity at the face. So this is not practical actually. So the second test point at the moment which we conducted the test, it is at 2.5 meter per second free area velocity. So if you can see the result, you can see that all of the manufacturers, their lower efficiencies are ranging from 35-65% only. I want to clarify one thing here that what MCA does, they don't allow any like meshes on the backside, they don't allow any filter on the backside when they do the testing of the sand removal efficiency. Like some other standards, like if you go to some other standards, they, some people, some manufacturers, they, behind their uh, lures, they install like meshes, like bird mesh, insect mesh, and they install, a, let's say, a filter, and they do the testing. So then they can achieve 90 or 80 percent efficiencies. But what MCA does, they don't allow to put anything on the lure. It has to be the lure itself because the type of meshes which are used can be different types. The size of the mesh can be different, the wire size can be different, type of the filter can be different. It can be GEH or it can be aluminum, it can be synthetic. So there are unlimited, you know, like possible combinations. So you cannot test and certify all the combinations. So what MCA does, they test only the lower itself. So the efficiency which you are seeing, it is the efficiency of the sand lower itself without any additional bird mesh or any filter. So majority of the uh, manufacturer, you can say their efficiency is between 35 to 65 percent. And the next test point is uh, 4 meter per second. So you can see here the efficiency is below 50 percent and further is even further below. So this type of loss efficiencies are like you don't need a sand lure, like it's useless. So, based on this certified data, the recommendation, we give the recommendation that 
you have to specify that the free area velocity should be maximum 2.5 meter per second. And the efficiency should be minimum 50% at that. To be fair with all the manufacturers. So how to select a sand rover? So now we have like recommendation that uh, based on the certified data that the free area, free area velocity shall be maximum 2.5 to ensure at least 50% efficiency. So let's take an example. For example, there is an airflow of 1,000 liter per second or 1 meter cube per second. To ensure maximum 2.5 meter per second free area velocity, the minimum free area of the sand lower will be calculated as 0.4 using the famous formula like Q is equal to VA. So this is an example of one of the certified lures uh, manufacturer. So I'm looking for a lure with 0 0.4 uh, meter square free area. So if I look at this chart, so it has to be minimum 0 0.4. It can be higher than that. So minimum is this. So we found here like there's a 0 0.416 square meter free area, which tells me that the dimensions of these lures are for this supplier are 1200 by 1200. So now I know the exact free area of that particular supplier, which is 0 0.416, and I know my airflow. So I can calculate the velocity with the same formula. So the velocity is coming as 2.4 meter per second, which is meeting like our requirement that the velocity should not be more than 2.5. So all the Certified uh, manufacturers catalog pages, they will have this graph, which is free area velocity versus the pressure drop. So if I use this velocity and I plot it on this uh, graph, so I can find the pressure drop of the central blower for this particular velocity and for this particular supplier. So my pressure drop is coming as 30 Pascal. <coughs> And then I have the wind-driven sand efficiency curve as well. So you will find this curve on all manufacturers who have AMCA certified sand trap lower. You will find this curve as well, this graph as well. So at your particular free area velocity, you can find what is their efficiency of their sand trap lower. So here is like 55 percent. So. So uh, any questions about any of the topics or subjects which I discuss here? Yeah. Yes, um, when you say uh, efficiency, percent, percent efficiency, this is the uh, portion of the sand which will be rejected. It is uh, like, there is, in the test method, there is like you are injecting uh, some amount of sand, and then there is a, pro like, the arrangement is some that what is rejected is collected down, and then they weigh this uh, weight of the rejected sand, and then this, this is defining the efficiency of uh, how much has been rejected, how much was injected, how much has been rejected through the lower, because some, sometimes some can be outside, so we don't count it as a rejected one. And this is the same usually if it's, uh, let's say, a very, uh, a very strong uh, sandstorm with, with a lot of sand in the air. Is it the same, uh, it, will be, it will be the same percentage if, if you see like here, like in the graph, there are different velocities, like starting from one meter per second free area velocity up to seven. So you could see already after 2.5, the efficiency of all the manufacturer certified products, they dropped below 50. And at seven meter per second, it was only like 5% or something. So in case of a storm, of course, uh, it's not like, uh, it, the efficiency will be like almost negligible. The same, the same efficiency it will be. Whether it is a big storm or whether it is a, a clear day. It depends on the velocity, you know, of the air, which but is passing. the same velocity, because you can have a, a stormy day, but the air coming into the uh, sand trap loop, it will have uh, more sand, but at the same velocity than a clear day. Uh, yes, okay. So then because, you know, like uh, the amount of uh, particles in the air will be more. So then maybe you can say that efficiency is higher, but we are not doing this type of, uh, you know, like uh, calculation, we cannot do. If the velocity is like uh, 2.5, like above like 2 or 2.5, this is the right range to specify, you know, like uh, center blower and do your sizing. 
because if you are sizing at one meter per second uh, phase velocity, it is almost like uh, three meter per second, uh, you know, like uh, free area velocity. And you can see, and you are specifying, I read a lot of the specification, we meet a lot of consultants, they are specifying at one meter per second, 96% efficiency of lures. So, because some of the manufacturers in part, they have, done, they have done the testing, but they have not done the testing of the sand lure itself. They have done this with some bird mesh, some of the filters. This is what Anchor doesn't allow, because this is purely the performance of the sand trap lure only. So, if you add mesh, if you add filters, of, of course, this efficiency will go high. You can put uh, several uh, sand trap lures in series to increase the portion of uh, sand removed. I don't know if it's practically possible because if you know, see the design of uh, sand trap lure, like you have flush type sand trap lure and sometimes some people have that only the neck of the lure is going inside the wall and the bottom of the lure is outside. So if you have multiple sand trap lures, how you will drain the sand out, sand out of the system? Because uh, after the first lure, even if the, the sand is filtered by the lure, it will stain the duct. So that will be the challenge. So for that purpose, you can increase the efficiency of the system by putting filters. And then you have to regularly like uh, clean those filters because uh, we conducted one seminar uh, like a couple of months back. Somebody asked, so he asked me that, okay, so how much efficient, how much uh, uh, frequency you will now tell us to do this uh, cleaning of the filters. So I asked him the question, how, how, how is the frequency right now? Because you are assuming your sand lure is uh, removing 96%, but it's not the reality. It's removing, let's say, depending on the velocity, only 50, 60%. So if you were, let's say, you are defining, you were defining that it has to be cleaned like every quarter. For me, it should be every month now. Because efficiency is like way, you know, like uh, otherwise what will happen, your system will choke. So this is like what I presented this graph. It is like certified data. It is not like one manufacturer without giving any names. This is all the manufacturers certified data. And you saw the trend. Trend is same for all of them. And this is the reality of, uh, you know, like a uh, real picture of the efficiencies of the sand, sand lures. Okay. Thank you. Any, any more questions? Anyways, uh, if anyone has anything, uh, you have my email ID. My uh, email ID is there. If you if you need any 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 clarifications later also, please feel free to write me an email. We can come and you know like we can visit you and we can clarify your doubts. So uh, that's it for me. And now uh, I will pass the mic to my colleague, Mr. Dipen. Thanks, Suman. Um, good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vipin Patel. Um, I'm the sales manager for a company called Silabi Medleaves, and we specialize in ventilation products. Um, enjoy the evening, and hope you enjoy the show as well. So, the learning objectives for today. Um, we're going to cover. Oh, okay. So the learning objectives for today, uh, we're going to be covering the AMCA's new fan efficiency energy uh, matrix. Um, there's actually two matrices which have been developed by AMCA at the moment, uh, which is the FEI and the FEP. Today's uh, session will be covering the FEI uh, majority. At the end, we'll also have some follow-up questions. Um, again, like Noman said, uh, if you have any questions, we're always there to serve you. So before we talk about why FEG, which we all know uh, that exists in the specification, has, uh, is moving out, let's just talk about why exactly and what the history is. So FEG as a standard was uh, established back in 2010 uh, from AMCA 205, and it made its way into uh, ASHRAE 90.1, which has been followed up till now. But then as the fan energy industry is evolving, um, we are learning from our mistakes and we've actually identified that there's actually a better matrix that can be used to define the efficiency of a uh, of fan. What FEG does at the moment, um, okay, let's, before we talk about FEI, let's talk about what a basic fan is. Uh, fan is basically converting, your, it's moving air. 
Uh, and what does the fan, how does the fan move air? It basically needs a motor to move the fan. Uh, what does a motor do? It converts electrical energy to mechanical energy. So now, as far as FEG is concerned, what it's doing is it's only giving a, a particular value, which is at its fan shaft power. Uh, obviously, the power that is being applied from the grid, uh, you have a lot of processes going in between, where you have your motor losses, you have your drive losses, you have your bearing losses, and then you have your finally the fan impeller losses on its own. Uh, let's talk about some of the typical fan systems that you see in the in the industry. This is a typical fan that you would see in an air handling unit. Forward curve. Um, so as far as the FEG rating is concerned, the rating would be given for the scroll for the impeller itself, and the shaft. However, what you get at the end is you've got the power coming in, which is at 100%, and all the inefficiencies because of all the components which are added in the system. And what you end up with is only 42%. There is a more efficient fan moving one step up. You have a better impeller, but the process is the same. At the end, you end up getting a better efficiency overall, yet you have to consider all of these um, inefficiencies in the middle, which are ignored by the FEG standard as of now. The plug fan or the pl plenum fan are becoming quite popular now as well. Um, good thing about this kind of a fan is you know, you're avoiding all the inefficiencies of the system by reducing the number of components in a system. So these are just a few examples. However, what I'm trying to show here is the effective uh, percentage that you see on the right here, that's what the power consumed is and not just the fan efficiency on its own. So this is a typical FEG grade uh, rating at the moment. Um, these graphs didn't just come like that. They obviously are historical data. It was uh, formed by a number of uh, engineers, designers, over a period of time, and they came up with these numbers. But what you will see is a small 5-inch fan can also have an efficiency rating of 50, so as a 40-inch fan. So, but really, in reality, we know that it is not right. I mean, you can have a bigger fan doing the same duty point as a smaller fan running at a much higher RPM. So what, what happens in that particular case is, even if you have the fan at your highest efficiency point, in reality, you're never having a fan which is running at the required duty point. It could be for many reasons. Maybe it's been oversized, um, it's running at a partial load, anything is possible. But what's happening? is you're losing all that efficiency gain in between. So the whole point of having a FEI rating was that we have an energy efficiency grade which is specific to the efficiency and the duty point. Here's an example of uh, comparing the fan efficiency, how it changes with the duty point. Now what you see here is we have different sizes of fans, right from 18 inch diameter up to 36. They're all operating at the same duty point. FEG rating is exactly the same. However, if you notice the efficiency of the system, it's 82% for a bigger fan, doing exactly the same duty point at a lower RPM. However, a smaller fan has to work much harder to do that. And in the process, it's consuming more energy as well. But then as far as a selector or a fan designer is concerned, he has the choice to select any of these fans uh, at his disposal. So this is where the fan energy index was uh, introduced by ANCA. Um, what the FEI has is when you have a fan system curve, it basically has a bubble or a fan area in which all the duty point selection is possible. Uh, designers are very specific and they design the fans only within that uh, fan curve or the bubble. Um, the future goal of uh, AMCA would be when they certify the manufacturer's selection software, they will only have the fans which are within that bubble. Um, in the process, obviously, what we will also get is some of the inefficient fans are going to be lost. And uh, yeah, so we are going to go into a much more efficient uh, fan types. And the emphasis is always on proper selection of fan rather than being on the efficiency grade side. This particular equation is something that comes from the new AMCA standard 208, uh, which gives you the equation to calculate the fan efficiency index. Um, so these are one and the same equations. It's just two simplified equations of the same thing. 
Uh, more details can be found inside the AMCA uh, standard 208. So the two uh, variables that we found here, are this is basically the detailed equation for calculating it. And as you would notice here, you have the selected pressure and the total airflow for the particular duty point listed in this equation. And this is your baseline uh, function where you would always be comparing your actual selection rate. Okay, so using those equations, I've basically got the same table that we had previously, uh, where you have oops, different types of fan sizes, same duty point again, and we have the FEG rating, which is exactly the same now. Yet, when you see the FEI rating, you have the FEI rating highest at that point. Now, with FEG, as we saw earlier in the, uh, in the fan curves, it's the same for a smaller fan as well as a bigger fan. However, when you see it here, uh, it's quite simple for anybody to identify if it meets the FEI rating or not. All they have to see is if, it reads, uh, if it's one or above, that means it's compliant. Whereas with FEG rating, what happens is you could have the uh, efficiency as the FEG 85, yet you might not know what exact duty point is and what the uh, operating efficiency is at that point. So it also makes very easy for a specifier or for the uh, check at the site, for someone to go there, check the label. If it says FEI 1.0, that means it's compliant. He doesn't have to dig deep into the specifications or the catalog is that, you know, how efficient the fan is. In this particular case, we now uh, are comparing again, again the same duty point where we have the most inefficient fan, which is the smaller one, and how uh, we can classify the different types of fans and uh, the ratings according to what the duty point is. This also makes it quite easier for retrofit programs where you have an existing building and you want to improve the efficiency of the building. You would have your baseline uh, fan existing right now, and if you want to improve it, you would basically just go onto the table and see how you can improve it by utilizing a much more efficient fan. Now, this, this uh, rating is obviously still not in existence, but it will be replacing the existing FEI, FEG rating uh, as early as 2019. These are some speculations of how it can be specified into the uh, project specifications. As far as the US federal or California regulation is concerned, they could probably call it uh, the FEI is greater than one at the design point. Uh, ASHRAE 90.1 would have uh, a similar kind of a concept. ASHRAE 189.1, which is more to do with the high performance green building council uh, standard, they would probably rate it slightly higher. And the same would apply for some of the retrofit projects where you want to improve the existing efficiency of the building or the standard uh, or existing uh, baseline. With FEI, uh, what has become possible is where you had the FEG rating where the whole range was, regardless of a small fan or a bigger fan, you would have the same uh, FEG rating. Here, you can specify the design point where your fan needs to operate it. And when you are specifying the fan, uh, we as engineers, as fan manufacturers, know that the most efficient fan is always at the highest uh, RPM of a fan. And what we can do is when we are specifying the fan, we can basically uh, have a small window specified as well, that if it's 15%, your FEI needs to be within the 15% uh, of one. And this, is, this will basically follow the uh, fan curve, which is for a constant speed fan. When you have a speed control function, uh, basically this is how the fan curve would look. And the FEI bubble that I was talking earlier is something like this. So where you have a high efficiency fan, it basically covers more duty points. Uh, when you have a low efficiency fan, it's going to be covering much less duty points. Now, as ANCA, we think that in, in, in future, uh, more of these inefficient fans are going to be obsolete. The reason being, if you have a change in your building, you have change in your airflow, probably this particular fan might have to be replaced. But if you have one of these fans, it's going to be accommodating those changes as well. As far as uh, where the information for the FEI can be found, um, as I mentioned earlier, standard 208 is available in the AMCA bookstore now. Um, 208 is integrated with the European ISO or the International Union 12759 as well. Um, the 
component losses that come within a fan system can be calculated using standard 207, which is uh, readily available as well. And finally, uh, for the fan performance itself, uh, it's the ISO standard 5801, which relates to the AMCA standard 210, which exists at the moment. As far as the manufacturer is concerned, uh, how would they specify or test their fan for FEI rating? Would be the fan performance testing would be done as per their standard 210 test. The uh, component testing will be done based on the standard 207. And then finally, the FEI uh, will be done according to 208. That will complete your uh, full certification of the product. Further resources uh, can be found on the AMCA website. Uh, there's white papers available to explain these features as well. And there's also a bookstore available where you can find uh, more details about this product. Now I'll open up some uh, time for some questions, please. So uh, now FEP will be our other specs. Okay. Now what we see in the consultant spec uh, is always FEG. Correct. So you're proposing that the FEI should replace FEG. Correct. And so consultants will specify only more than uh, one as, as an FEI. Yeah. So FEI is the minimum you can have as one. Anything above is basically your uh, you know, improvement in your class. FEG, you're right, wherever you see in the specifications, um, you know, as fan manufacturer, you always see I need to meet 85, FEG 85 or FEG 67. But really what you have is just the efficiency of the impeller on its own. There's a lot of other components that go with it uh, that also need to be accounted for because that's the, uh, the resultant is what is going to be your power consume. Yeah. Thank you. So as, as that should happen uh, as early as 2019. That's good. That's can we take it as a general condition that uh, fan running in low RPM is better than fan running in high RPM? Is it something we It really design? depends on the duty point. I mean, it can't be generalized that way. Um, you know, you could have the same duty point as I mentioned earlier. You can have a bigger fan running at a lower RPM, smaller fan running at a higher RPM, and get the same duty point. So but your energy efficiency is much better in a lower RPM? For a bigger fan, not for a smaller fan. Yeah. For a bigger fan. Right, now I'll pass on. Any other questions? Sorry. Question. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, in small fan, you have the, as you know, the total efficiency or mechanical efficiency is uh, uh, proportional to the flow and the total pressure, mm -hmm. and you got to proportional to the rate of power. Right. Fan loss. Sometimes in the small fan, when we have that the efficiency is. Uh, is low, below 50% for the small fan. And uh, how the consultants, in, the, in this case, will ask you where efficiency, your efficiency is low. Okay, how uh, do you think you can convince the consultant in, uh, in such a case, in your opinion? What are we talking about? Are we talking about a FEG rating or are we talking about the overall efficiency? Efficiency, total efficiency of, of the uh, or mechanical efficiency. Yeah, I mean, um, as far as the fan sizing and the efficiency is concerned, that's actually a property of a fan. Where you have a smaller fan, the efficiency yeah, is lower yeah, yeah, on small, the lower side. Small fans, rather than this on the lower side. Uh, it has uh, lower efficiency. Mm -hmm. It's less than 60%, let's say. Yeah. For bigger fan, when you have high flow rate, high total pressure, the efficiency will be around 70 or right. something like that. Yeah. So the question is, we are facing this, this sometimes, you know, the uh, consultant comments, you know, well, what is, your efficiency is low. And try to explain to them about this, uh, that the, about the formula, this a proportion, and this and that. Okay, so in your opinion, you know, how you, uh, uh, it's good to educate maybe the, uh, you know, like the consultant, and then make a, uh, is actually, Mm -hmm. Make like uh, or any can make a seminar about this. So we can consult about this. I believe certainly changes are you know difficult like anything. Um, this is a new standard which is obviously going to take some time to absorb. But the whole idea of having this is that you have that common ground and you get that efficiency point which you can compare with. Now I or you cannot change if it's a smaller fan, it's less efficient. That's that's going to be a fact. If you have a bigger fan, it's going to be more efficient. You know, that, that's a fact. 
But what this gives is, if you have a defined baseline, you know this is the most efficient duty point or the fan selection that I have. At least you can tell them, look, I have been through the exercise. I've looked at the smaller fans. I've looked at the bigger fans. This is the most uh, you know, suitable for your application. Small fans require a small motor. Yeah. Normally, small motor less efficient. Mm -hmm. As a combination, mm -hmm. it will be small. So not only fan, the mm -hmm. motor also mm -hmm. smaller, always less less efficient. efficient. Yes. This is as a combination. Correct. So I think the effect of motor would be more than the effect of the fan. Certainly, certainly. I mean, uh, again, it's it's a combination of the system. It's not just the fan we're talking about. It's not just the motor. There's obviously all the components that's in between. And the resultant is your uh, efficiency. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll pass on to my uh, gentleman, Mr. Tanmoy Chaudhary. Next. One sec before uh, a brief uh, advertising, nice wireless Bose comfort, quiet comfort, noise reducing, canceling headphones. Um, my colleague here will be surreptitiously and quietly walking around, not so as not to take away from the next presentation. But if you have a business card, you could drop in there. We'll make the selection at the end. So thank you. One business card. Yeah. Nice try. Leave it to the Brit. Hi. Um, good evening. My name is Tanmoy. Um, I'm a technical and R&D manager from uh, MicroCurve. So you saw fan efficiency and the total efficiency. Now we'll move a little bit towards the system. So when the fan installed in the system and how it react, what are the efficiency you get normally? This is a practical approach more. So that's why I have more on CFB results for you. Hope you like this presentation. So the first uh, objective that today we're going to cover, which is uh, different fan type for sure. Um, uh, we'll talk about forward curve, backward curve, exit flow fans, and so on. Then we'll talk about system effect, which uh, how your fan uh, installed practically, and what are the efficiency of the massive. Then a few case studies for sure, and, and I'll share some CFD results for sure. So the first question, um, if the fan is tested um, and classified, why do we see deficient performance at site? This is the first question that we always have, especially from the contractor, consultant, as well as from the owner. So if I'm already uh, brought a fan which is certified by FEG, um, AMCA 210, AMCA 300, uh, that means airflow tested, sound tested, as well as the efficiency, why I'm still getting deficient uh, performance for the fan. Before that, we should know um, how the fan tested, and then um, how, when it is installed in the system, how it's going to behave. So this is a little bit about the basics, how um, we see a fan performance curves. So your y-axis is the pressure, um, x-axis is volume flow rate. Then you have uh, efficiency, static, total, Static pressure, total pressure, as well as your power curve. Um, this is the base, uh, what do you say, the operating range, the base operating range the fan should work with. So backward curve fan, we call it 40 to 85% of wide open CMS, that is the maximum flow rate. If the fan you're going to operate here, we call it system surging. Then similar way, we have a, a forward curve fan, 30 to 85 percent of forward open CMH. And this is the axial flow fan. Here we call 65 to 95 percent. And this region we call stalling region. So this is a system. Um, your fan RPM curve, we call it performance curve. And then you have a system resistance curve coincide together. That is the operating point. So we'll talk about a little bit about the system right now. So main three topics we'll, we'll touch together uh, to understand the system. Um, first is, is the outlet connections, then your uh, non-uniform inlet flow, and then swell and fan inlet. 
So outlet means we are talking about ducts for sure, then diffuser, elbows, turning vanes, damper, branches, uh, plenum, and so on. This is a vector diagram of um, centrifugal flow fan. When you talk about um, a vector profile uh, with a positive side, which is called 100% effective duct length, where you can see the all are in positive side. So that means you're achieving catalog performance at 100% effective duct length. Whether you talk about centrifugal or axial, the behavior is different. Maybe in the center and negative. For uh, centrifugal, the cutoff range is negative, but both the fan uh, have 100% uh, catalog performance you're going to achieve at 100% EDL. The similar way, we have effective duct length and different segments at 12%, 25%, 50%, 100%. and 100%. These are the factors applied to calculate your system as a factor. Similar way with the centrifugal. So the calculation is called about 2.5 meter for a 12.7 meter per second. So we call it as APM divided by 1000 into diameter of the fan. So that, then how you achieve your 100% effective duct length. This is how your uh, elbows. So this is ideal condition where you have 100% uh, effective duct length. These are your uh, inlet, similar way ducts, elbows, boxes, vortex and straightener and so on. So same example with inlet elbows with an effective duct length. So this is one example of centrifugal fan where you can see you have inlet, both, both are inlet boxes. This is more on rectangular, this is more on elbows. But still you can see a lot of negative vectors and swirl are there. So this is somehow you manage the ducting a little bit at the inlet so that you achieve or allow the fan to bring 100% uh, inlet air. This is a few examples uh, with inlet bosses, vortices. You can see those examples there with a rectangle box. These are some improvements uh, that we, we, we saw at site. Those are the missing area that uh, no turning veins uh, at the fan inlet. These are another example when you have uh, plenum fans or uh, two axial flow fans installed in, in parallel. Um, it, the recommended is one diameter of, of space between two fans. Here, if it is a, a, a two fans putting it inside a cabinet or in a plenum, we should have kind of a splitter so that we have 100% effective uh, airflow inside, inside the chamber. So this is how the fan tested. Um, we, uh, the example right now we have AMCA D, which is inlet ducted and outlet ducted as well. So this is a typical example of figure 12 testing, where this is the test fan, this is the auxiliary fan. And these are your nozzles, these are your setting screens, because all you're talking about is, a, is, a, is a laminar testing here. So this fan tested and rated by AMCA. Now the same fan you're putting into the system right now. So the inlet cone is still there, outlet duct is still there. Now this is uh, the conditions I'm going to apply is both side of plenum. So obviously there is, uh, you're deviating the fan performance. So these are the available uh, uh, testing installations procedure uh, defined in AMCA 210, which is A, free inlet, outlet, B, C, and D. Now system effect that you're talking about uh, from the beginning that when the fan rated and tested and put it into the system, how it's it going to behave. So this is actually a system effect. One example, the straight duct, uh, inlet and outlet. We're going to apply an elbow here. So you can see that from all our examples on the vector diagram. So there is no effective duct length at all. So that means this fan uh, maybe have 25% to 30% of the catalog performance. So an example, we have a plenum. In this case, you are maintaining effective duct length. Imagine I remove that duct and then plenum is just at the center close to the fan. So that means, again, you are spoiling the fan uh, with an improper uh, airflow at final level. One example to calculate the uh, losses. So an engineer, I mean, if you see the resistance chart for any designer, they always calculate the duct losses. They forgot uh, other factors. So I'll go through a few examples here. 
So let's say we have um, 5,000 CMH uh, capacity of fan. Um, so fixed and loss probably 750 and the straight duct. And the same uh, fan, I have an inlet duct as well. Um, um, and there, there, you can see that from A to E, from entrance loss, because there is no inlet cone, so there is 100 pascal already added. And then you have um, elbows at the inlet, this is this one. And then you have obstructions in this one. And then you have abrupt discharge. So all if you add, so your 750 become on 325 pascals. Another example, uh, we can clean up at outlet. Let's say 2.5 that you are maintaining. This is an ideal situation if you wanted to have a plenum. So you have contraction losses as well as velocity losses. So you have 922 as an overall uh, ESP uh, for, for the fan. And then same fan, I just remove that outlet duct and plenum is directly on the fan outlet. So here you can see that the system in factor added has 145 pascals. So practically you need to select a fan at 1071 pascal instead of uh, 922 pascal. So this is a typical example. Uh, manufacturer proposed you one, which is the this one is a yes, static pressure. This is the volume flow rate. Now at site you are achieving two. That means this is a deficient performance. So to achieve one, the same fan you need to operate at the highest speed or you need to eliminate the ACL from the system. So changing speed, there's a couple of drawbacks. For sure, uh, maximum safe operating speed because it should not uh, exceed the uh, critical speed of the fan. And then increases power, so you need to see the installed kilowatt motor, whether it is enough to handle the BKW or not. And then obviously, uh, new motor size, uh, with an obviously higher RPM, more noise. So these are the drawbacks when you have a similar fan, same fan, in order to increase the speed. So I will give you some practical uh, scenario from, from the side that we normally see a day to day basis. Why do you pick CFD? Because in the CFD, uh, only the tool that you can simulate and see uh, are the results, uh, how the velocity profiles are, how, how ex exactly the, the vectors are behaving. And then obviously for CFD simulation, you need a proper 3D model. So normally we ask our uh, clients, contractor, consultant to help us with actual uh, inbuilt drawing so that we can develop a 3D boundary conditions and apply uh, all the flow rate that you are actually observing inside. And then obviously we keep that tolerance factor as a 5%. Uh, that's, that, that's how you rate this uh, CFD software. And then we use pressure and velocity vector simulations, and then we present a proper report to the client so that they know the actual system is behaving peculiar. It's not actually the fan. So they should know the system have different, different pressure losses at different stages. This is one typical example to go with. I have only three cases for you. This is the first one. This is my um, typical car park uh, exact extract system. Uh, these are the fans, one, two, three. These are the uh, inlet, these are the sound baffles, and these are the uh, inlet and outlet attenuators. And this is the area where all the fan has a common uh, exhaust point, and it is all going to the top. So these fan, uh, the combinations are, they can work together, or they can work, uh, uh, depends on your carbon monoxide percentage. So the total capacity will be 150,000 CMH multiplied by 3. So this much volume flow rate during fire mode. So this is the condition right now. So when you uh, apply the, the, the maximum point, which is the fire conditions, the all fan are working at the, the same speed, we saw a lot of turbulences in this area. And one condition we saw, one of the fan plate failed during uh, this uh, fire mode. So then we, uh, when you saw this, we saw a lot of area, the, the way one fan velocities is interacting with another one fan velocities. And there is no separations here. So then we come up with some solutions. We separated the flow from different directions. We reduced the system effect factor. And then we able to achieve what is the catalog performance we have declared. Practically, what do you do in this case? 
Right. So we added some kind of a, a separator just to separate the flow because all are going to the top. There is no other way around. So we remove those baffles first. We remove these baffles because this is actually spoiling your inlet flow here. And then we added a separator in this condition. So this air will not mix this one. This will not mix with this one. So all with a smooth exit on, on top. This is another example, similar Kappa, because why you pick Kappa? Because Kappa has the biggest capacities uh, that we see nowadays. So this is a typical floor uh, with the um, inlet louvers and damp uh, fire rated damper, sorry. And then these are your uh, fan installed without having effective duct length. So this is a combination of a supply fan and extract fans. The supply fan, we saw there is a um, marginal um, decrease, which is 4%. But when you saw with the uh, extract fans, there was 12% of the flow losses with the uh, improper uh, inlet flow. Because you are not maintaining any uh, effective duct Because cleanup is very close to the, to the fan. This is another typical example. This is an uh, inlet duct and this is the outlet duct and the fan is in the middle. And this is the two-speed motor driven. And this is the scenario right now. So you can see there is a vortex here and this is the fan. So practically the air is not going anywhere. This is all creating a huge swirl in this region. So we saw up to 30 to 40 percent reaction with this flow. But because this is, a, this is such an installation that you cannot do anything, you cannot rectify the duct. So practically, they remove a little bit uh, just to give uh, 50 to 55 percent of the effective duct length. And then we just increase a little bit with the fan sizes so that they achieve the catalog performances. So these are all my case studies uh, with the ACF safety factor, uh, system factor. So. If you have any questions, then I can answer. Can you measure the system effect in the system that side? Can you go back to the presentation? Yeah. Can you measure the system effect? No, you cannot measure it. With a Peter tube, you cannot measure system effect uh, losses. It has to be calculated. I, I just keep those because of the longer presentations. Is there in AMCA 210? I can share with you. If you can share your card, I can share with the whole calculation procedure. Thank you. Okay. Uh, in option part, is it necessary to provide guidance? Uh, again, depends. Um, guidance required. So my question is, there's a specification actually mentioned that actual fan requires a guide wing. Yeah. Now, if you provide effective duct length as per calculation and you provided that length actually, so why is it uh, still in uh, the consultant insisting to provide guide wing? I think uh, there's a two things. One is a venaxial fan and one is a guide wing that you're talking about. Venaxial fan itself has a higher efficiency than a normal fan. But if you are maintaining effective duct with an axial flow fan, you need to give any guide fans. That's not required. Is there any uh, chart which you can refer to to see what is the effective uh, duct length required? Yeah, yeah is there. Okay. That's what you can use a simple formula of uh, APM, that's uh, uh, velocity divided by 1000 into multiply of the fan dia. Then you arrive at the effective duct length. Let's say 2,500, which is close to 10.16 meter per second, divided by 1,000, so 2.5, multiplied by one diameter of the fan. That means you need 2.5 duct length at inlet and outlet. That's how you achieve that performance. If you're deviating it, then you have to add the system to the factor. So normally at site, people say, if you're measuring the Peter tube, that means I saw the whole losses. That's, it's not practically correct. So a system effect means your system designed it not a proper because the fan is just in the laboratory and you're putting in a system where you don't have effective duct length. So it has to be calculated. 
before you uh, actually ask your team to check with the actual losses. And uh, I mean, how does it relate between the suction side and the discharge side? Is it almost the same, or do you have a effective uh, length for the suction side, which is separate, or? Practically, both should be the same, but uh, inlet effect uh, to achieve your catalog performance, outlet is more into your resistance. Yeah. So let's say you have a deficient fan performance. If your inlet is correct, then you can be able to plot that point on the performance curve if your outlet is wrong. But if your inlet is wrong, you cannot plot anywhere in the performance curve, somewhere below or somewhere there. So practically, you're not able to find out what is the exact site uh, external static pressure is if the inlet is wrong. Okay. But if your outlet is wrong, you can able to plot. All right. Okay. Thank you.